Hello, it's David again. So it's been a little while since uh, the last video. Um, so what have I been up to? Well, the truth of the matter is I've been messing about. I've been enjoying the fact that uh, DSTB1 and DFB1 have been released and they're not without their problems. I'm going through some of those over on the uh, the Exos forum. Uh, drop over uh, there if, uh, if you've built one or you're looking for some help uh, or you're interested and you can see what the uh, the issue that, that people are having uh, is. Mostly it's around that bloody FPU on the uh, DFB1. Um, the FPU is kind of an optional thing, so if it doesn't work, it's not the end of the world. Uh, but getting the FPU to fit in those sockets, always problematic. DSTB1, uh, that's been working absolutely fine for me, uh, but the uh, the only other one that I know is definitely out there in the wild um, has been having some uh, some problems in uh, with certain... Um, certain things in a different motherboard. So that could very well be um, some motherboard incompatibility that we need to look at. But all that development's going on over there. And if anyone has built one of these and wants to contribute their, uh, their experience, then please uh, do come along and join. But in the meantime, sort of taking a bit of a break from those, what I've been, uh, what I've been having a play with is my STE again. Now this isn't STE specific, but I wanted to do it on the STE purely because um, it proves I'm not cheating. What we have here, just down in the corner, is a little cartridge port slot that's got an oscillator on it, a CPLD, everything has to be a CPLD when I'm involved, um, an SRAM chip, and a couple of uh, flip-flops. Uh, there's some wires that go out the back to a VGA connector, and there's some resistors there. A few lines running across the top here go to uh, a slightly modified firmware on DSTB1, and I'm listening on three of the address lines. Uh, above what's available in the cartridge port. The cartridge port goes up to address line A15. So 16, 17, 18 are being listened to here. And there's a chip select and uh, a read-write um, line going off and also a um, DTAC return. Well, so what's it doing? Well, shall we have a quick look? Well, it appears to be running Doom. Very, very slowly. But it's running Doom. And it looks like it's doing it in approximately 16-bit colour. Well, it's not. It's doing it in 12-bit colour. This is uh, Doom running uh, on an STE with 8 megabytes of alt RAM, with 4 megabytes of ST RAM, running under Mint, uh, with a 320 by 240. Um, it's technically 12-bit colour display. So this is, these are chunky pixels, so it's one word per pixel, and uh, it's using the Falcon 16-bit um, palette, except it's only using the, uh, the highest four bits of red, green, and blue. So it's, it's effectively a 12-bit display. And, uh, well, this is what you get. Uh, you can see it's not perfect. It's very much uh, in the uh, experimental phase. And this is the highest resolution it can do in this, this mode uh, at the moment on account of design flaw that I'll talk about later on. But uh, yeah, here we go. So the, the issue, the main issues that you can see are um, the RAM read and write is not perfect. I'm pushing, I'm, I'm pushing the bandwidth of this right to the, uh, the very limit and it occasionally gets a misread or write so that you get the occasional dot. The background is supposed to be uh, a 50-50 dither and you can see there are some missed ones and some extra ones somewhere and when I move the mouse around you see look it kind of messes it up over time uh, just because I uh, can't need to redraw it fully. Yeah, so it tends it tends to write okay but the readback is, is a bit dodgy so the mouse tends to, to mess, th mess things up. But it's uh, it's certainly a technology demonstrator. It's not intended to be obviously used for production. Um, but it is genuinely full uh, true colour 12-bit chunky display. And it should also work in a Falcon. And why would you want to work in a Falcon if you've got a 16-bit? Well, the, the real aim for this was to actually do 8-bit chunky graphics. Um, I couldn't find a VDI that worked. There is, however, a Falcon VDI available. So this is using FVDI uh, as the, uh, as the, uh, the VDI backend. Um, So this is, as I say, just a little demonstrator, but it's, it's meant to work at 640 by 480 
in um, in 8-bit color, which uh, which is the ultimate aim. And the reason you'd want that on the Falcon is because you could do it in chunky mode. And things that go through a, a chunky to planar conversion would uh, no longer need to go through a chunky to planar conversion. Really, I'm thinking about uh, Anders Granlund's uh, Basilic 2 Mac emulator. Uh, wouldn't it be nice to run that in proper 256 color mode uh, and play all those Mac games, which are bloody sight better than the ones that the Falcon got. So here's a full, this is actually a 24-bit uh, color wheel, uh, resized to fit on the screen. Uh, and you can see where the 12 bits come out on this. Uh, the uh, There we go. Uh, let's go full screen. You can see you can actually see the bands here, can't you? Where the uh, where the twelve bit artifacting occurs, uh, but that's pretty good. There's not many. There's a few little uh, miswrites around the side there, but there's not many things going wrong there. And that's uh, uh, that's quite nice, which which shows that it's the reading back that's primarily the problem. And obviously, that's my uh, my thumbnail for the uh, the previous video that I did. So the way this works, uh, this uh, basically it boots up uh, on um, a different screen. I think this is how a lot of ST graphics cards work. So what we have here is is, is a two screen setup. So uh, let me take you through the reboot process. So basically all of our XBIOS text output appears over here and this is our screen here. So as you can see at the moment that's still frozen at the last thing uh, that was written to it. Uh, this sits above the main memory. Uh, what I'm going to do is just run Emutos because it works better with... Uh, I oh, I found a bug. I uh, should have mentioned that. I found a bug with my um, Ultram driver for the STB1. So this is why I'm using Emutos at the moment. It doesn't have the bug. So there we go. We've got our 8 megabytes of RAM. And this boots into uh, Mint, which, uh, which doesn't have to boot into Mint. We can do it... Uh, We'll do it without mint, but uh, this then loads FVDI and FVDI switches to here we go a 320 by 240 16 bit screen at uh, C00000. And once that switches over, I've just got that with a pause at the moment. Once that switches over, we should start to see the screen rendering over here. There we go. Now you can see the speed's not bad. And it's got FVDI has got some very decent uh, graphic acceleration abilities. Uh, bearing in mind that this is chucking around. Well, first of all, it's larger than ST low, so it's 320 by 240 instead of 320 by 200. So it's larger straight away. So it's going to take longer to, to draw the screen. There are uh, per line uh, 160 bytes per line in ST low. Here, there are 640 bytes per line. So we're looking at something in the region of four and a half times slower to redraw the screen, and yet FVDI in the 16-bit mode still does a really quite excellent job. All the old favourites work, obviously, but this is actually, ha <laughs> here we go, Look, this is quite an interesting demonstration. If you see up here where the mouse is, where it's redrawing the mouse all the time, uh, you can see bands moving across as, as something's not quite right with uh, the, uh, the read back. If I turn off the read back, it's, it, you basically just get the white, uh, because it always returns FF, FF uh, which is white, and um, you move the mouse around the screen, it obviously paints white all over the place. So um, I know that's not perfect. But hey, it's a bit of fun. And this is a bit of fun. This is now a full, true color, 12-bit display on a standard Atari ST. And it does work at 8 uh, megahertz mode as well. Uh, it's uh, purely, obviously, this is an accelerated machine at the moment to, to make my life easier. So let me talk you briefly through how this works. This is our circuit board. These are the cartridge connectors uh, on this end. Uh, Standard uh, stuff to start with, we've got a diode hit coming in here to protect uh, from accidental inverted insertion. If you plug the, you can plug the ST cartridge in upside down. If you do, it goes bang. You, uh, you connect 
uh, VCC to ground. Whoops. So the diode's there just to protect that. And uh, that comes in here, feeds into a voltage regulator, which then provides 3.3 to the rest of the board. The whole rest of the board is 3.3 volts. Uh, we've got our normal CPLD down here. This is a, um, a Xilinx uh, XC144 uh, um, XL in a 100-pin uh, package, and that turns out to be not quite enough. So if I make another version of this board, it will go up to the 144-pin uh, the package, and I'll probably have to get bigger. We've got a socket over here for the oscillator. This is a 50 megahertz oscillator. Technically, to do VGA, it would have to be 50.2 something megahertz, but my screen just about latches on. Uh, the, the, the pixel uh, clock is something like 25.1 uh, um, megahertz uh, on standard VGA. So dividing this down by two is it's close enough for government work. We've then got uh, uh, up here SRAM chip. So this is um, I think off the top of my head, that's half a megabyte of SRAM. Very, very quick, 10 nanosecond. That's needed. And even then, it's not quite quick enough. Um, this is 10, 10 nanosecond CPLD as well. Uh, and the, here we've got two flip-flops, which I'm using as latches. So these are two 16-bit flip-flops. Um, one dealing with input from the uh, um, the ST. One dealing with output back to the ST. And 16 bits in uh, 16 bits on, on this side going to the ST and two sets of eight bits on this side I mean it functionally it's equivalent but these are actually all joined together so basically this is an 8-bit bus in here so we trigger first this side then this side or when we're writing first this side then this side latch and then that feeds everything out that latches when it sees the chip state coming uh, the CPLD coordinates uh, that latching process and drives into the uh, the SRAM, which is again uh, eight bit. So this the, the the you know data zero line and the uh, the data eight line are connected together, and we we basically um, multiplex. Uh, and the CPLD handles all of that, and that switches. Uh, it's a four way state machine at uh, fifty megahertz. So first it will read uh, a, a high byte. Next cycle, it will latch the high byte and read from the input, or write, depending on which direction. Next cycle, it will latch that and read another byte, read the low byte, etc. And it just goes around in a loop. And it's a little bit tight timing wise. It'd be better if there were some breaks between it. And that's why we see the dots of things on the screen. So when it's doing its, um, its, its outputting operation, obviously it's reading from here and it's uh, latching that into the CPLD itself. And it's evaluating the uh, the bytes, in this case the words. So it'll do two reads, store those, evaluate it, and then output it to the VGA display, which is through a simple resistor divider. So there's a red, green, blue, four-way uh, uh, resistor um, network. Uh, here's the VGA socket up the top here. So we've got uh, the uh, V-Sync and H-Sync. This is the RG and B output. And the inputs along the bottom, this is obviously the programming header. There's a couple of spare pins here for um, uh, the ROM3, ROM4 activation, which uh, we don't use. Uh, we've got three test points, and we've got an address select, a read-write, a DTAC, the three extra address lines that we need, and a chip select. Uh, I haven't used the address select. We do use the read-write, the DTAC. We do use the chip select. So a lot of the logic uh, as to when this fires has been handed off to the... Um, uh, to DSTV1 since I have control over that. If you know we didn't have that and we wanted to actually just listen to the, um, the CPU uh, and, and decode ourselves, we could certainly do that. We would just need more address lines. We would probably have to listen to, we probably have to have an, an additional eight uh, address lines coming in so that we can identify when we're being spoken to and respond accordingly. I mean, perfectly technically possible. It's just I've already got a system to, to do that, so I haven't bothered. And this is all, this, all just for a bit of fun. Uh, on the back, we've got our standard pull-up resistor networks, a few uh, capacitors, and the, uh, the the socket is intended to mount on the bottom, so that when it plugs into the, the ST, it sort of rests on the socket and doesn't flap around a bit in the breeze. So uh, that's not needed at the moment because I've decided to hotwire them off while I was experimenting. 
So any more ideas of what I can try and run on here? Um, I'd be uh, more than interested to hear them. Uh, this at the moment is uh, AES 4.1 uh, soft loading. Uh, this is just booted from the, um, the auto directory. It's just, it's quite photogenic. It's, uh, it looks a bit nicer than, uh, uh, than the plain uh, TOS 2.06 desktop. Uh, but there's nothing particularly special about it. Just booted from in here. Uh, and you can see this isn't quite as uh, snappy and fast as, uh, as Emutos and, um, and the, uh, the uh, XAAS Teradesk desktop. Uh, but, uh, but there we go. We have a, not fully working, let's be honest, due to, uh, due to that design decision to go with, uh, with the 8-bit bus. Uh, but a very, uh, uh, I think, a nice bit of fun, a nice little diversion. And uh, really, I think it's time I probably got back to sorting out some of the problems with DFB and DSTB. So, speak to you next time. Thanks for watching.